Let's go to Isaiah 48. I've put all the verses on the screen. Of course, you may be reading from your own Bible. I'm not sure what the situation is with uh, picking up Bibles just at the moment. I think probably that's still uh, disallowed, but um, I don't think we'd be too fussy about that. Feel free to pick one up. I shouldn't say disallowed, I should say against guidance. Isaiah 48 then, let me read these words to you and then we can start to unpack them. The words of God to his people, listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is his name. I foretold the former things long ago. My mouth announced them, and I made them known. Then suddenly I acted, and they came to pass. For I knew how stubborn you were. Your neck muscles were iron, your forehead was bronze. Therefore I told you these things long ago. Before they happened, I announced them to you, so that you could not say, My images brought them about. My wooden image and metal god ordained them. You have heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. They are created now and not long ago. You have not heard of them before today, so you cannot say, yes, I knew of them. You have neither heard nor understood. From of old, your ears have not been open. Well do I know how treacherous you are. You were called a rebel from birth. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not a silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols has foretold these things? The Lord's chosen ally, that's Cyrus the Great, will carry out his purpose against Babylon. His arm will be against the Babylonians. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I will bring him, and he will succeed in his mission. Come near me and listen to this. From the first announcement, I have not spoken in secret. And at the time it happens, I am there. And now the Sovereign Lord has sent me, endowed with his Spirit. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like sand, your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be blotted out nor destroyed from before me. Leave Babylon, flee from the Babylonians, announce this with shouts of joy, and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock, and water gushed out. There is no peace says the Lord, for the wicked. It's a little prayer. Father, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your 
truth, to your word, uh, that you would speak deeply into our lives, and that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story is told of uh, an American president, Franklin Roosevelt, who had to uh, often endure long receiving lines at the White House, that is, people who had lined up to say hello to him or to greet him. And he complained that whenever that happened, no one really paid any attention to what he actually said. One day during a reception, he decided to try something. To each person who passed down the line and shook his hand, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests responded with phrases like, Marvelous! Keep up the good work! We are proud of you! God bless you, sir! It was not till the end of the line of greeting the ambassador from Bolivia that his words were actually heard. The ambassador leaned over and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming, sir. <laughs> Listen. Listen is the, the word for today. The key word. And it's the word that's repeated here over and over in Isaiah 48. Verse 1, listen to this, you descendants of Jacob. Verse 12, listen to me, Jacob. Verse 14, come together, all of you, and listen. And even verse 18, or verse, sorry, verse 16, come near and listen to this. And it's even implied, isn't it, in verse 18, if only you had listened, if only you had paid attention to my commands. And apparently there's uh, seven other places in the passage which use this idea. Uh, we won't go into it now. But across the whole Bible, 699 times, by one estimate anyway, one computerized estimate, 699 times, God says to us, to his people, listen. Well, three simple questions I think can be asked. How why and what? How are we to listen? Why are we to listen? And what are we to listen to? In English, listen is different to hear. In some versions, the word is hear. H-E-A-R. But listen is probably a better word because listening is different to hearing, isn't it? I'm sure you can hear me now. You can hear a noise coming from the front. But you may not be listening. I don't know. I hope you are. And in Hebrew, in the language in which the Old Testament, which Isaiah was written, to hear this particular word, or to listen, is to obey. It's the same idea. Hear and obey. Listen. Do something about it. Respond. The word includes the idea of responding to what you're hearing. Listening is proved by obeying, responding, believing, repenting, doing something as you hear it. Even if that's only praising him for his salvation or confessing our sin. Or perhaps going to do something. Making peace with a brother or sister or somebody in your family you've fallen out with. It includes the idea of response. A uh, great uh, old preacher, a very wise old preacher, I remember once said um, that whenever you hear the Word of God or read the Word of God, read the Bible, then uh, respond somehow. Somehow respond to it. Don't just let it wash over you. But somehow, even if it's only confessing sin or praising Him for His goodness, do something. Respond. Jesus told a story, didn't he, about two sons. One who said, when his, uh, when his father said, uh, son, go and work today in the vineyard. He said, yes, dad, sure, I'll do it. But he didn't go. And the other who said, no, thanks, dad. But later he changed his mind and he went. And the second son was the one who did what his father wanted. It's no good just to hear, is it? It's no, it's no good in, in Scotland. They used to call it sermon tasting. 
You're just tasting it, but then you go away and you think about, and you do other things. Are you responding? Are you responding to the Word of God? Well, then why? Why should we listen to this message? Why? Why pay such careful attention to it? Why listen in order to, to change our lives, to do something about it? Well, there's all kinds of good reasons. As is very typical in the Bible, God gives us reasons, good reasons, why we should take a particular course of action. And we've seen this a number of times, haven't we, in, in the prophecy in the book of Isaiah. We are to listen to him because he's God. Because this Lord, this God of Israel, is the one true God over all. And he's proved it again and again. He's proved it particularly in Isaiah through predictions that have come true in the future. Verse 5, before they happened, I announced them to you. In other words, he predicted, he told ahead of time what would happen. In, the, in, its, in that time, the Assyrians would come, and then the Babylonians would come, the Babylonians uh, themselves would be defeated by Cyrus the Great. He even names the king 150 years before it happened. Cyrus, he names him. The guy didn't even exist yet. It was 100 years before he was even born. So again and again he's proved that these predictions came true. And this was not mere guesswork. This was not God just being a very clever guesser or guesstimator. We make guesses about things, don't we? We may even make predictions. You might predict that England will win the Euros. A very good chance they will, I think. Or that the Queen will reach a hundred years old in a, what, four years, three years' time. You might well get those right. But if you look carefully at verse 3, you'll see that it's more than just prediction or guesswork that's going on here. God not only predicts the future, but he plans it, and he determines the future. So look at what it says. Uh, My mouth announced them to you, these former things, and I made them known, you know, well in advance of them happening, then suddenly I acted and made them happen. That's what God does. This isn't just prediction, this is God uh, for ordaining or planning or determining what is going to happen in the future. Clear evidence, says Isaiah, over and over again that this Lord, this, this Jehovah, this Yahweh, this particular God of Israel is the one true and living God. Over against all of the idols, Bel and Nebo and Marduk, well, Marduk was Bel, but those names, some of those names we've had back in 46, of those Babylonian gods, or the Egyptian gods, or the Assyrian gods. They were just idols. And they could never do this. They could never predict, and things would actually come true. In fact, God says here that he gave more than enough evidence. Look at 4 and 5. He says, I knew how stubborn you were. Your neck muscles were iron. Your forehead was bronze. Therefore, I told you these things long ago. Before they happened, I announced them to you so that you could not say my images, my idols, my little wooden and metal gods, brought them about. There was no possibility of saying that because it was in advance of when it actually happened. God proving himself again and again. But their hearts were stubborn, verse 4. Their necks were iron. We speak about brass necks, don't we? Their skepticism, their cynicism, which is also in our hearts. We are slow to believe, aren't we? Isn't that what Jesus said about two of his disciples in Luke 24? And we see that again and again in the Bible, so that when, as you probably know, when Jesus rises from the dead, they are so slow to believe, they are so skeptical. They take a lot of convincing. And so the Lord gives them more than enough evidence. 
A famous philosopher once was asked what he would say to God if God existed from his point of view, and he met him in the afterlife, he would say to God, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. But the truth is he has given us more than enough evidence. In creation, in the skies, in history, in Christ, in his resurrection, more than enough evidence. And so in verse 6, he calls on his people to do what? Just to admit, to acknowledge that he is God. On the basis of all this evidence, all this proof, just to think about it all and admit that the Lord is God. And their images, their idols of verse 5, are nothing. And I wonder, do you see and will you admit that this God alone is God? And he has proved it in multiple ways. We get to look with them, don't we, at this evidence of predictions that came true again and again. But we also get to look at Jesus, don't we? We live much later than they did. We're far more blessed in that respect. We get to look at his life, his death, his resurrection. We get to see all of that evidence presented by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And see that Jesus is Lord. But these are not just the words of a dictator. Admit, bow, kneel before me, acknowledge my authority over you. There is plenty of grace here, isn't there? So here's another good reason why to listen. Because it's grace, this message. And you need it. Verses 9 to 11 especially, I think. For my own name's sake, says God, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold that wrath back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. Interesting, not exactly sure what that part means. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Refined, tested, purified. But then again, these words, you see them twice, don't you, in verse 9. For my own sake, for my own sake, he's driving it home. He says it four times in three verses. For my own name's sake, verse 9, for the sake of my praise. Verse 11, for my own sake, for my own sake. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. He's doing it for his own glory. It's the ultimate reason. For anything, for everything, for the glory of God. It's why the universe exists. It's why Christ came. First and foremost, for his glory, which is wonderful news for the universe because the glory of God is the good of his creation. But the great good news for us here is that this grace and salvation, this offer of peace and well-being, back in 18, for example, do not depend finally on our performance. It doesn't depend on what I deserve or you deserve. But for his own sake, not for our sake, but for his own sake. There's a wonderful freedom and there's wonderful good news for us in in those words. It is to display his kindness his compassion, his glory to the whole world, and even to the spiritual world, if we were to read Ephesians 3, that he shows such grace to his church, to his people. You see, what did they deserve? They deserve, verse 9, destruction. They deserve to be wiped out, and so do we. That's the absolute truth. But instead, they got his discipline, loving discipline to refine them, to purify them, like metal. And that's a good thing, isn't it? It's good to be purified. It's painful, but it's good. The furnace of affliction purifies and strengthens us. It it straightens out our priorities, doesn't it? As we often say, suffering gives us a sense of perspective. It reminds us of what really matters in the big picture of things. A man who has just been diagnosed with cancer, for example, is probably not going to be out all night celebrating England's victory over Ukraine. As good as that was, when you're suffering, seriously suffering, going through the furnace of affliction, those other things fall away. 
they're not as important as you thought they were. And you're purified. So this grace, this tough love, as we've called it before, this severe mercy is something we need. Even when it gives us a hard time, it's still good for us. Psalm 119, verse 71, It was good for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees, so that I might realize what really matters. And when we listen to his word, and we listen to his word, and we recognize his grace even in the tough times, well, then we receive more grace. And we can say again with the same man who wrote Psalm 119 in verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. He's been through the furnace of affliction, and he's been purified. And now he knows what really matters. Well, why else should we Listen, well, because it's good and you know it. Particularly verses 17 and 18. These are lovely verses, aren't they? This is what the Lord says. This is uh, Isaiah 48, verse 17. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you and directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands. Your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Aren't these really kind of tempting words? Don't you feel yourself drawn to them? This is a God who does what is good for people, and especially for his people. He teaches you what is best for you. He wants to give you peace and well-being. How can you resist that? If only, he says. Now, like I said at the beginning of the service, there are many if onlys in life. I wonder how, what your if onlys are and your regrets. We all have them. But there's none bigger than those that relate to God and the gospel. And yet it's not too late for them, is it? The good news is it's not too late. God is not saying, if only you'd done this, but now it's too late. I'm writing you off. No, no, it's, there's still an open door before them. They can have the peace, the well-being, and the righteousness. You can still take advantage of this gospel. And that's true for you, whoever you are. While there's life, there's hope, we say. And while there's life, the gospel door is open to you, the door of grace. Whatever you've done, however you've messed up, whatever you regret doing, if you listen, if you listen so as to obey, so as to embrace, so as to take hold, That includes leaving, doesn't it? Leaving Babylon, verse 20. Well, they would actually do that. Many of them, actually not all of them, not even most of them, but about 50,000 would go back to their homeland. They would leave Babylon. But I think this is also a picture, isn't it, in verse 20, of how God's people are not to be of this world. Not to be of this world. In the world, but not of it. Now, there's a balance to be struck here, isn't there? Some of you will know that sometime later, Jeremiah, who comes after Isaiah, in the, at least in the order of the Bible, uh, later announced uh, to the people that they were to settle down in Babylon for a time, for those 70 years. It's in uh, Jeremiah 29. Uh, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, and... Uh, most importantly, perhaps verse 7, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city, even though it was a foreign city. Uh, even though they were in exile, captured, in captivity. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And in the same way, we want to strike a balance here, don't we? We do seek the peace and prosperity of the city of London. But that doesn't mean that we have to share the perspective and the priorities of everyone around us. We seek the peace and prosperity, but we don't share the priorities. We don't, for example, and we see it everywhere, celebrate pride. We celebrate purity. We love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Or we should. We welcome all. But we don't have to share the same point of view. 
I just remind you, we, we worked on this a bit, didn't we, in our constitution, our balanced attitude toward our, our gay uh, community, uh, neighbours and friends. We, we said this, it is therefore part, this is in the constitution, it is therefore part of our position that, I'll just knock some words out, we in no way condone, promote, assist or encourage homosexual practices. At the same time, we strongly reject homophobia and welcome all to the church in the name of Christ. We hold out God's offer of forgiveness and the power to change in Christ to everyone who, like all of us, have fallen short of God's standards. Likewise, we enjoy the football, perhaps. You don't have to. <laughs> you may enjoy the football. But we don't get carried away. We don't worship the England team until they fail. It's not a matter of national pride or national shame, is it? That, isn't that ridiculous? I was thinking when, when Germany lost, there were all kinds of headlines in the German uh, newspapers, and it would have been the same over here, that it was a national shame. It's only a game. Don't get carried away. It's a fun game, but it's only a game. We worship and celebrate the Lord, don't we? We worship and celebrate His grace. We boast in Him. So we do want to seek the peace and prosperity of our city and be good for our communities. And I think there are ways in which, through night shelter, through cookie jar, through youth group, and other ways that we, we seek to do that. We seek to bless people in all kinds of ways. But actually, we're not good for our city or community if we become exactly like it, if we share the same values. We are meant to be like salt, aren't we, said Jesus. The thing about salt is that it is different from the rest of the food on the plate. It's not just another potato or grain of rice or lump of meat. It's a seasoning that you add to food to improve its taste, to add flavor. And Christians should be amongst those, should be those, who by the grace of God bring flavor, flavor of goodness and kindness and truth and righteousness to our neighborhoods. We're not to become just like the Babylonians, or we lose our flavor. Here's a fourth reason, because there's glory and you'll love it. A fourth reason to listen, four reasons to listen, to listen in, to listen in order to obey. In verse 6, God promises new things. It's not the first time he's promised new things, uh, so here it is again. From now on I will tell you of new things, halfway through the verse. That sounds exciting. We all like new things, don't we? Fresh new things. He may have meant the time when the people would come home again from the foreign land they were hauled off to. But I'm pretty sure even more he means Jesus. He means the servant will see more and more of in the coming chapters, particularly from 49 to 53. Or 55, even. Jesus may even be hinted at. He may even be speaking through, if you like. This servant may be speaking through uh, these words in verse 16. And now the sovereign Lord has sent me, endowed with his spirit. So the new thing refers ultimately to Jesus, not just to them coming home from Babylon. And when you think about it, what a wonderful new thing Jesus was in the world. No one ever spoke like him. No one ever acted like him. No one ever lived like him. His character was beautiful and kind and compassionate. He was a beautiful new human being who did the most amazing new things. If ever there was a new thing, the coming of Jesus was it. And we are to look back, aren't we, as we take communion later this morning. We look back to that new thing, that new covenant, that new human being in the world. Not like old Adam, this is the head of a new humanity. And we can revel in all the new things that have come to us through him. And we can look forward to all the new things that are still to come because of him. This wonderful future lies ahead of us in Christ. I know some of you really love to think about heaven, about glory, about the new creation.
going to be just spectacularly breathtaking. Wonderfully satisfying. Beyond your wildest dreams. Promised to us, isn't it? That newness is promised to us in Revelation 21, where God says, I am making all things new. Revelation 21, verse 5. I think he spelt out those new things in the first four verses. Verse 1, a glorious new world or environment. Secondly, glorious new bodies. New personalities, maybe. Spirit and soul and, and body. All renewed in Christ, verse 2. A glorious new closeness to God in verse 3. Probably the very heart of heaven. A new intimacy with him. A new presence. I will be with them, he says. And they will be my people and I will be their God. And verse 4, a glorious, a beautiful new order with none of the bad old stuff we have now. No more death or mourning or crying or pain in this new order. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Revelation 21 verse 4. There are very good reasons why we should listen to this God and to his message. And then finally, what? What are we to listen to? Well, the obvious answer is to God and to his word. To the Bible where his words are recorded for us. Written down. So they can't be tampered with. And what I want to say to you is this, that the only sure word we have from God is the word that we find in the Bible. Otherwise, we are not sure, are we? We are not sure. And we can easily get blown around by different teaching if we start to go off to listen to other voices but if we stick with the Bible or if we keep coming back to the Bible in order to check that what we're hearing is the real deal is true then we have as one Christian put it very nicely no fear of being deceived no fear of being deceived no fear of being led astray we don't have to worry or wonder is that God? Is that his idea, his voice? That thought that I'm having, is it really from him or not? Rely on the word of God. Now, I want to try to bring this down into the most practical of ways in terms of our everyday living and decision making. We, we need to be beware, don't we, I think? We need to be very aware that our own desires will often lead us astray. Our own hearts can be very deceptive. We should be very suspicious of our own hearts. Beware of the voices. Beware impressions. Beware feelings. Beware leadings. Stick to the word of God. Let that guide you. Let that provide the framework in which you make your wise decisions to the glory of God. Now there's a tremendous amount of Christian mysticism here that perhaps needs to be cut through. This is a really helpful book. The Decisions Made Simple. You see, some of us have known Christians who have convinced themselves to leave a marriage partner because they have fallen in love with someone else. And they have taken that, falling in love, as God's will. Now the Bible is very clear, isn't it? Very clear. We're, we're shown the parameters. We're shown the guidelines. We're shown the boundaries, aren't we? Of what is right and wrong. If you're, if you're making a decision about your relationships, go to the Bible. Get guidance. Don't rely on your feelings and impressions, which will so easily fit in with your own selfish and sinful desires. This book is very clear on that. Make gospel priorities shape your decision making. So, for example, I'll give you an example. You're thinking about a new job. How does the Bible help you to think about a new job? Well, it doesn't tell you directly wh whether to take that job or not. You have freedom to, to make that decision. You're given minds to make that decision. Someone said God doesn't promise us guidance to save us from the bother of thinking. We have to think and think through using gospel-shaped priorities. So he says, for example, when you're thinking about a new job, you ask yourself questions like this. Well, I know it's God's will that I... Provide for my family's physical needs? Will this job help me do that? I know that it's God's will that I nurture my family's spiritual health. Will this job help me do that? There's going to be complications. There may be 
you know, there, there's going to be all kinds of things to consider. But these are great questions to ask. It's God's will that you serve your church family. Will this new job help me to do that? It's God's will that I proclaim Christ's name. Will this job help me to do that? It's God's will that I love my neighbors. Will this job help me to do that? It's God's will that I give generously to support gospel work. Will this job help me to do that? These, these are big questions, aren't they? But here's the thing, I think. We should not expect, and he says it this way, God just to zap us with the answer to our questions we should think it through biblically and let the gospel shape our priorities. Otherwise, we'll quickly find ourselves being pulled away into selfish and sinful directions. Our hearts are desperately deceitful, aren't they? Let the Bible guide you. Beware. God's will is in God's word. It lays out a framework for us and it gives us freedom in which to make I would say not will of God decisions, but wise decisions. Well, you may have something to say about that later on, but um, I submit that to you as, as a great way forward as you make decisions in life. Let the gospel shape your decisions. What impact is this going to have upon my family, upon my church, upon my community, upon my witness? You have to ask these questions as you make decisions. And I know many of you do. God has spoken. He is his word. His will is in his word. As far as it goes, it sets a framework for us in which we make decisions based on gospel priorities. It's not based merely on impressions or feelings or leadings. I think one of the best ways, and many of us are practicing, practicing this more than ever, that one of the best ways to find the will of God and to listen to the Word of God is to come to Bible study. Because at Bible study, you can do so together. It's not just you and your Bible. That's great, by the way. But when you come together with others, they might see it a different way, or they might help you to see it a better way. And together you can work through to a clearer understanding of what it means. So if you're not involved in a Bible study somehow, may be hard for you to, to factor it in, to find time for it. But do try to get involved with other believers. We run a few and we'll be willing to run more, I'm sure. So that you can be guided by the Lord's own word into his will for your life. Well, I've gone on a bit, but I'm sorry. This is a, a challenging chapter. Lots of good news in it, but challenges us to, to trust God, to leave the ways of the world behind and trust him. And it ends on this warning, doesn't it, in verse 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Now, this is where the expression, no rest for the wicked, comes from. You see, this is not a threat. We might think of the Bible often uh, threatening us or God threatening us. He's not that kind of God. He doesn't threaten people, but he warns us. And a warning is a merciful thing, isn't it? A warning is a good thing. If there's a danger up ahead, if there's a road sign that says danger with a picture of a crumbling cliff on it, then it's not, not a nasty threat, but a well-motivated warning. And something to be grateful for. And this is the God, isn't it, who, who teaches us, verse 17, what is best for us and directs us in the way we should go and who wants us to know his peace and well-being. And so, follow him. Trust him, obey him, and follow him. Using his word to guide and shape your life with all the freedom that that provides within that framework. May God enable us to trust and to follow him. Let's pray. Father, we pray that our hearts would not be stubborn, our necks would not be like iron, but Lord, that our hearts would be soft and open to you, not naive or gullible, but open to what we can clearly see as truth, proof and evidence. Thank you that you have given so much evidence that you are real, 
that you are glorious, that you are good, that you are amazingly kind. And help us to run to you and find grace and salvation. May our lives be guided by your word, Lord, and not by other voices, whether from our own thoughts merely or from our feelings, or indeed from YouTube or, or uh, other places where we might be led astray by people who speak well but don't speak truth. Please protect us, make us wise, help us to keep coming again and again back to your word. And we pray that more and more we'll join in our Bible study groups so that we can share together and uh, seek you together through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen.